Turn with me to John chapter 6, a kind of famous verse. We're going to focus on verse 35 today where Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And we've been doing this series here called Jesus Unveiled. And we're looking how John take certain events and moments in Jesus' life to make sure you understand that Jesus is the one from the beginning, the God who created the world, the one and only true God. And so John has been doing this um, thing where he's recorded a bunch of miracles of Jesus that we call signs. And now we're going to look at these I am's of Jesus where he just keeps saying over and over and over again, I am, I am, I am. And we understand, church, that when Jesus used this term, I am, that he was referring back to the Old Testament when God's people were enslaved in Egypt and God said, Moses, I pick you. Whole burning bush thing happening and God says, Moses, you go back to Egypt, you free my people, you tell them the God of their fathers sent them, and Moses, maybe a little overwhelmed, as I think you would be too, to go up against the greatest army on the earth that time with no tanks or any special high-tech equipment, <laughs> Moses says, uh, can you give me a calling card? They might ask me, what's your name? And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God spoke to Moses and said, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And church, let's be really clear, the people of that day, especially the religious leaders of the day, they understood when Jesus said, I am, I am, I am, I am, they understood that Jesus was claiming to be unlike every other religious teacher, that Jesus was claiming to be unlike every other religious leader, that Jesus in that statement, what they heard at the time, Jesus claiming to be God himself, Jesus claiming to be the creator of all that is, Jesus claiming to be the eternal one from the Father, Jesus claiming to be the one who makes things like bread and light and people and all that you need, Jesus claiming to be the one and only who can meet your every need, who can fill you. So John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, and let's do this. I'm going to say Jesus said to them, and you read this, okay, with the force that you may think Jesus said it with, okay? So if you're whispering, we're missing it, right? Jesus said to them, Did you catch what happened there? Jesus makes a declaration on the bread of life, and then he actually makes a promise, I will make you full. So I want to I want to say something about my hero, okay? Just to jump us into this passage here. Here's a picture of my hero. That's Grandma Fanny. It's an interesting name. Grandma Fanny, that picture was taken in 1970. I was nine years old at the time. I showed this picture about seven years ago. Grandma Fanny is there making homemade pizza. All those ingredients came from her garden and there you'll see there's a loaf of bread and she's making this homemade bread. And y'all, every time we'd go there, we only ate homemade bread. I was nine years old. I can still smell that dough. I can still smell that bread baking in the oven. And I can still hear her little metal sifter with the flour. Shh, 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 shh. And, and I'm just going to tell you right now that some people in my family think I'm picky. It's not my fault. Grandma Fanny ruined me. 
We, we had some pizza a couple nights ago from a peach restaurant here in town. Everybody's saying how great it was. I was like, oh, it's a little greasy if you ask me. Uh, and, and it's why this bread here that you buy at the grocery store for $3.49, 100% whole wheat, blah, 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 blah. You know what, y'all? I'm just, and I can, I can actually smell this bread a little bit because there's a little cut in the plastic here. It doesn't smell good to me. I'm actually at best disinterested in it, but it disgusts me a little bit. And it's not because I inherently am picky. Y'all, I want you to know, Grandma Fanny ruined me, okay? So, you know, if Vila ever says I'm picky, just tell her, oh, it's this Grandma Fanny's fault, okay? Y'all, you know what the best part of when Grandma Fanny made that bread? She would actually grab a clump of the t- dough and pull it off, put it in a little mixing bowl, cover it with uh, cellophane, and stick it in the um, refrigerator. In the morning, I, my two brothers, and two sisters, we would wake up to the smell of that dough frying in about an inch pool of oil in a cast iron skillet. And when we would get to the table, there was this fried bread and we each had a bowl of granulated sugar to dip it in. And we would do some serious feasting on that fried bread. In fact, I submit to you today, that was bread from heaven. There we go. Do I need to even say anything else here? Y'all, I, I, I did realize eventually that not only was that bread filling my stomach, those moments were filling my heart. We just had our grandkids here, and I'm remembering something special about a grandparent who's loving on you, doting on you, doesn't really care what you do because you can just send them home to their parents. And in those moments, our hearts were filled as well as our stomach. And I want to ask you this today in light of Jesus' words. Could Jesus be that real to you? Could Jesus be that real to you that when you hear his declaration, I am the bread of life, and you hear his promise, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, he could make you full. And so I want to ask you this question, church, today. The whole sermon, I just want you to wrestle with this question. Do I believe Jesus can make me full? Do you believe Jesus can make you full? And here's how we're going to think through this as we walk through this passage. We're going to talk about the importance of this thing called bread. And we're going to talk about the reality of hunger. That actually God gave you hunger. So you would know what it's like when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. We're going to talk about the importance of bread, the reality of hunger, and we're going to talk about the necessity of feasting. And I love that as I think about being at my grandmother's table. Importance of bread, reality of hunger, and the necessity of feasting. So let's start here in the importance of bread, especially during that time. And y'all, you get a sense of this just when you think about the passage And I'm going to jump in at verse 25. I want to remind you of the context. We actually talked about the context for this a few weeks ago. If you remember, Jesus is in the wilderness with a bunch, a bunch of people. And it says he fed how many men? 5,000 men with a few loaves and fishes. We know that must have been 10, 15, 20,000 people because they were just counting heads of households. He feeds all these people in the wilderness in a place where they don't have fast food and Christian fast food places like Chick-fil-A or uh, In-N-Out Burgers. And it says in verse 25, 
when they found Jesus on the other side of the sea. Now, here's what happened. After he feeds them, of course, they want to take him by force because they want a bread vending machine, right? And they want somebody who's going to rule in such a way that they're never going to lack anything, including bread. And it says that Jesus went away from them. He crossed the other side of the sea. He actually walked on the sea. We talked about this last week. And they come looking for him the next day. Rabbi, when did you get here? And all of a sudden, they're going to start this big conversation about bread because here was the importance of bread for them. Bread was central to their diet and bread was central to their memories. Bread was central to their diet and central to their memories. You see, bread, everybody there was eating bread every day. Some people sometimes ate meat, maybe more often they ate some vegetables, but everybody every day ate bread. Everybody could have heard times where they heard, maybe not the sifter, but the wheel grinding the grain. Everybody on a regular basis was smelling fresh bread, not that stuff I showed you. It was central to their diet. We're talking about the importance of bread. And also, it was central to their memories, okay? Because when bread was talked about, they would think back to their hero. They would think back to their great-great-grandparents. They would think back to Moses in the wilderness, their ultimate hero. And how God working through him, there's bread coming down from heaven. And knowing that's on their mind, Jesus says in verse 32, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, I just got to pause here because this little phrase, truly, truly, I say to you, if you've ever read an old King James Bible, it really pops out because it says, amen, amen. And this is a little formula for Jesus to say, if you take notes, now is the time to take notes. If you underline in your Bible, now's the time to underline your Bible. If, if you're, you know, you got your note app open on your cell phone, this is the time to mark something down, okay? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Let's be really clear. Guys, Moses wasn't the one who was actually bringing that manna down from the wilderness. He was at best the Mrs. Bear's delivery truck, okay? Verse 33, for the bread of God is he. Jesus is referring to himself. And, and this little phrase several times, who comes down from heaven? Guys, what was Jesus thinking and claiming about himself over and over and over and over again, unashamedly, unapologetically, I'm coming down from heaven. And I give life to the world. So here's what Jesus is doing. He says, yes, let's talk Moses here. Let's talk about manna in the wilderness. Jesus is saying, when you think about Moses, when you think about manna in the wilderness, what I want you to do is ultimately think about me. When you think about, when you remember with fond memories, because you guys weren't the ones going through the wilderness, when you think about with fond memories, this idea that God was doting on a group of people, that God was loving our people, that God and Moses, the hero, the great, great grandparent was making sure all our needs were met. Jesus says, I want you to think about me. When you think about the importance of bread, Jesus says, I want you to think about me. Now, I want to tell you why I bought this bread today, y'all. Because, and, and why I tell you about my grandmother, not just because I want to brag on my grandmother, and not just because I want to make excuses for my pickiness, but because it's really hard actually for us to connect with this. And you can just read John 6 on your own. I'm the bread of life. And you just keep reading. And nothing is blowing up in your soul or even in your heart or even in your gut. Because we buy a loaf of bread like this from Kroger or wherever. 100% whole wheat. No artificial flavors or colors. No artificial preservatives. No artificial ingredients. It's interesting that they've got to say that, right? Um, and what you really want to know, and y'all are waiting for me to read, 
is it gluten-free? How much sugar is there? Oh yeah, here we are in the back. And, and frankly, for most of us in our culture, <clears throat> where we have so many options when it comes to food, we look at something like this and we actually want to distance ourselves from it. That a lot of us have said, I'm not eating bread on my diet. So it's hard. I'm coming here today to talk about the importance of bread because Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And he says, somehow you're going to relate to me like you understand bread and how important it was to eat it every day. That sometimes you ate a little meat, more times you ate vegetables, but for sure, every day you ate bread and people were making it in your home. And somehow that memory and that part of your diet was critical. And so... I want to ask you, church, I just want to stop for a moment and ask this question. And, and I'm asking this question whether you've been here a day or a hundred days. How important is Jesus to you, really? How important is Jesus to you? Is, is he like whatever it is, the main staple of your diet? Is he like needing to eat something every day, day in and day out, and if you didn't, you would die. So here's, here's one thing to do this week. I want you to think about, you go to bed tonight, you get up in the morning, you feel hungry, and before you break the fast, with breakfast, whatever you eat, I want you to think about what am I going to eat for breakfast in the morning? Piece of toast, piece of fruit. You're going to have your oatmeal all laid out and every little ingredient like I do to save time. I've got it all in these little boxes, put it all together maybe the night before, stick it in the fridge. Before you break the fast and you feel hungry, right before you take that bite, you pray this. Jesus, fill me. Jesus, fill me today. Think about it right now, because if you don't, you won't do it. So think about it right now, that moment, tomorrow morning, because you're wrestling with this question, do I believe Jesus wants to make me full before you break the fast, Jesus fill me, okay? That's the importance of bread. Now, some of you are still thinking, though, but, but what does that mean, Jesus, make me full? Well, let's talk about the necessity or the reality, I'm sorry, of hunger. The reality of hunger. And even as you dig in this text, and when Jesus talks about things like hunger, we understand that our hunger is not just physical, right, church? It's not just physical. And we also understand that our hunger is shaped, right? It's not just physical, and it's shaped. There was actually a theologian who became really popular in the 70s and 80s. And one of his lines that he wrote went like this, everybody, everybody who lives, everybody in this room, everybody has a hungry heart. Isn't that good? Yeah, do you get that? Everybody has a hungry heart. And, and Here's a picture of that theologian. We call him the boss, Bruce Springsteen. Y'all know what song I'm talking about? You need me to sing it for you? This is a good one. Everybody has a hungry heart. And you know what's fascinating in that song? Everybody has a hungry heart. And then he says, had a wife and kids in Baltimore, Jack. I went out for a ride and I never came back. And he's talking about there was this hunger that was driving me and instead of fulfilling it in a way that was actually healthy and leading to life for me and my family, I went out for a ride and I never came back. And he talks about it was just like a river that just kept him moving. Whew. Jesus, after saying to him, sir, give us this bread always, it's in that context Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And this is part of why I say it's not just physical, it's being shaped. You know, in the Gospel of John, one of the things that gets repeated over and over again is the word life, 36 times throughout the 
Gospel of John. It's all about, we're all looking for life, right? And just in this section, 18 times, life, living, raised, eternal. And there's a couple words that you could have used. One of the words is bios. It's the word we get biology. It's talking about life as this thing you can feel and touch and blood running through my veins, eating physical bread and all the processes that happen when it's going through me. That's not the word John uses. That's not the word that's recorded over and over again. The word that's recorded is zoe. This word refers to quality of life. It refers to that that we cannot touch and see all the time in a world where we're so focused on everything. I can feel it. I can touch it. And Jesus comes to him and says, I'm the bread of life, and I'm not just talking about physical. In fact, he challenges them. He says, guys, you got to look beyond simply getting a full stomach. You see, in verse 25, when they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus responds in verse 26. Look at it. He again says, truly, truly, y'all, I say to you, mark it down, write it down, put it in your notes. You are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Remember, the miracle was a sign to point people to who Jesus really was. And Jesus says, you're seeking me not because you saw it as a sign to something more and something greater. You just wanted your gut full. And part of why you're going to get disappointed with Jesus is because he's not always going to give you the physical thing you wanted. Because the hunger that he has created in us is so much more than just a physical thing. In fact, yo, this wasn't a new idea Jesus presented. That way, way back hundreds of years earlier, God had already made it clear to them he was trying to show them something through manna. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says that God humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna in the wilderness which you did not know nor did your fathers know this is Moses to the nation of Israel and then he says this that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord that you've got a hunger but Jesus says I gotta be the one that fulfills it that you got a hunger that's more than just physical. And, and I want to say something about this because we know it's, it's not just bread, right? You know that you have hungers for things like this, intimacy in relationships. And I want to tell you that's a good thing that God created. And here's what happened at the fall. All these things get twisted off. And so we go trying to fulfill that in ways that aren't healthy. You know, every person here, you actually have a hunger to be great. That God created you with that hunger when he created you, Adam and Eve, in a garden that was great, and they were going to connect with him, the great one, all the time. And everybody here has this desire to be great, and we constantly are trying to fill that hunger in awkward, unhealthy ways because of what happened at the fall. Right? Everybody here, you know, you have a desire for something really good. There was shalom, peace in the garden. And that thing got twisted off. And so all of us, we're, 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 we feel really, really hungry for peace. And so we choose a lot of things, right, that actually are not healthy for us to get that peace. We've got these desires, these hungers that it's not just physical. And you know what else, church? Let me be clear here, too. They're, they're shaped, right? See, they're coming to Jesus. They wanted to force him to be king because their hungers were being shaped by their current circumstances. They wanted to be free from the Romans. They wanted their own comfort, convenience, and control and all those things. And we know this about our hunger is shaped. And I'm going to just remind us of a couple docu-series that came out that taught us this. One, supersize me. 
Okay, how many watch Supersize Me, right? Okay, I'm not cracking on McDonald's here, but you know the guy, he, start, he said he was going to eat at McDonald's every day for a year or I don't know how long, and he was going to supersize himself every time and get as much of it to eat as he could. And what was so fascinating is the first, like, two weeks, he had a stomach ache the whole time. And then something happened inside of him where he started craving McDonald's. And we all learned about gut science and that there's microorganisms in our gut that begin to be developed and shaped according to what you eat. And Jesus says that's true spiritually. Just keep feeding on the same thing and you're going to be hungry for it. And, and so I'll remind us this other docu-series that I talked about when we did Philippians, The Social Dilemma, remember that one, y'all, where they were interviewing the guys who created things like Facebook and Instagram, at least some of their apps and some of the different um, likes and stuff you put on that. And they're interviewing two of these guys who had left because they were freaked out about it. They said, we created something to overpower you, and we found it overpowering us, and we said, we got to get out of this. And, and they're interviewing these two guys, and one guy says, yes, we are trying to capture your attention. And we all listened to that and thought, ooh, that doesn't sound very good. And another guy goes, no, it's worse than that. We are trying to shape your identity, and we're trying to shape your desires. We're trying to shape your hunger. And church, why I tell you this, I want you to just understand two things. Jesus understands when he comes in and says, I'm the bread of life, and no one comes to me, no, no one who comes to me will ever hunger, he knows that every moment of every day, you're being shaped, you're being spiritually shaped, your hunger's being shaped. And that's why we ask the question, do I believe Jesus can make me full? Now, the, the second thing I, I, I want to say on this is, Here's what happens in my own heart when I start seeing those hungers and desires really start raging and I'm aware there's some temptations here to run after things in an unhealthy way. He, here, here's the first thing I do. I shouldn't think that. Let me kind of stop that down. And y'all, I'm going to ask you not to do that this week. I'm going to ask you to do this. I want you to think about going to lunch. Like before lunch comes, here's something I... I often, people often hear me say, Vila has heard me say this five billion times in our marriage, I'm really hungry. Oh no, there it is again. I'm really hungry. And when you are sensing that thing coming upon you where you are, you feel the hunger. You feel whatever comes with it, the temptation or whatever. Instead of just saying, I deny it, I don't have it. Why don't you do this? Lord, here's my hunger. You're aware. You know everything about me. And you still love me. You know everything about me. And you're still for me. God, here it is. Jesus, help me believe you can make me full. Got it? So maybe at lunch this week, think about this right before you eat your lunch and you're aware of your physical hunger. Hey, Lord, what is, what's... What's the hungers rumbling around in my heart? Because everybody has a hungry heart. Jesus, help me believe you can make me full. The importance of bread, the reality of hunger. Now let's talk about the necessity of feasting. I, I love this idea, the necessity of feasting. If you want to understand how to relate to Jesus, you have to actually think about it in these terms. Bread, hunger, and feasting. When I was a kid... If I did not get up those mornings when my grandmother was frying the bread from heaven, um, it went, if I did not get up when I was smelling that fried bread from heaven, if I did not pull myself out of the bed, if I did not push myself up to the table, if I did not take my grimy little hands, which I'm sure I did not wash before I went to the table, and take that bread and dip it into the sugar and put it in my mouth and use these white pearly teeth to chomp it down, I would have never been made full. Amen? My brothers and sisters probably would have been glad. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 47, let's look at it. Truly, truly, 
There it is again. I solemnly tell you, whoever believes in me, believes in me has eternal life, life forever. Now, I love that Jesus put belief right in the context of bread, hunger, and feasting. And I want to say there are people here every Sunday who I know who have been thinking about Jesus for a long time. Maybe you grew up in a a family where you, they have believed in Jesus, but you've never really believed in Jesus. And maybe you really haven't connected with this word belief. And, and you just have this sense that it's a head thing, but you know it's got to be more than that. Jesus says, think about it this way. Think about it, feasting. Think about, think about me like the most important thing maybe you do every day physically is you eat a meal. And, and think about me. As the one who, I, I fulfill hunger in such a way that you're going to live forever. And so, Jesus says in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Verse 49, he goes back to the whole manna in the wilderness. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Jesus, referencing himself, says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven. And they grumbled when they heard that, y'all, because they understood again Jesus' claims so that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And watch what he says. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And y'all, you know what he was referencing there? His perfect life, he lived on this earth, his death on a cross, and his resurrection. Jesus says, believing is like feasting. Jesus says, y'all, can we put it this way? It's like feasting on me, like the joy of children feasting at their grandmother's table. And for some of you, you need to hear this. Very practically, ways we feast on Jesus is we read our Bible, we pray, we gather in community, and too often, you know what we're saying? I have to read my Bible today. I have to pray. To somehow try to get feeling good about your relationship with Jesus and get Jesus feeling good about you. It's not that at all. It's Jesus who came and died and now puts the bread on, from heaven on your table and says, let's, let's feast together. Let's just get in the word and feast together. Let's, let's have some time of prayer. Let's feast because it's all about joy. Let, let's gather here and come planning to feast on Jesus together in joy. And he just keeps pressing the issue. If you see verse 53, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 55, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Could Jesus hammer this anymore? Y'all, when I heard true food, when I read that this week, you know what I thought of? Y'all know what I think of. The restaurant, True Food Kitchen, right over there. How many have been to True Food Kitchen? And, and just to take one more stab at convincing you that this is so much more than physical, that, that there's a feasting going on that your heart and soul long for, I want to read you a couple quotes from their website. True Food Kitchen is the only restaurant fundamentally based on science, which ensures all of its craveable dishes and drinks work to increase the longevity of our people and planet. They know that every part here hungers to live for a really, really, really long time. Jesus says, I am the only food that can cause you to live forever. Would you believe in him today? I, I'll show you one more from their website. Through wholesome, intentionally sourced ingredients, we transform superfoods into comfort foods that make you feel better with every bite. They're peddling something other than physical bread, aren't they? They're peddling joy forever, they think. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, and you're coming to me so often for just some physical things, and I'm telling you, it's more than that. It's more than that. Y'all, as we come to the table this morning, 
I want to I want to tell you the secret ingredient of why my grandmother's bread was so great. Y'all gonna write this down, huh? I haven't been given permission by my family to tell the secret ingredient, but I'm gonna do it today. Y'all, you know why, as a nine-year-old little kid, I had so much joy eating that meal? Do you know why, at the end of the time, when we were there as a whole family, my brothers and sisters and I were like, okay, can I be the one who gets to stay an extra week? My grandson Zeke looked at his mom yesterday as they were about to go, can we have a Poppy and VV camp without you and dad here? Yes, awesome. Do you know what the secret ingredient was of our joy in her bread? It was her joy of having us there. <laughs> she loved it. She loved every minute of feeding us. Of course, I was about that big around at nine years old. So it was really important to her for me to eat more and more and more and more. And so she's cooking 24 seven. And every time she made that bread, she had a smile on her face there in the kitchen. She constantly had a smile on her face. She was taking so much joy, watching us have joy over her and what she was making. And I submit to you that for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. He considered it no big deal until he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high that part of that joy was you. And, and that right now, Jesus is taking incredible joy over you as we are just feasting on his word together. And so let me say two things here. For those who have yet not believed in Jesus, I, I really want to encourage you as this little, these two cups come stacked together. One has bread in it. One has some juice in it. I want you to know it's okay to let this pass today. And really what I want to ask you is to consider believing in Jesus. To consider doing this, saying, Jesus, I want you to be my ultimate feast in life. Because we're all going to feed on something, right? We're all going to find something to make our ultimate feast. We do it every day just to say, Jesus, I believe in you as the only one who can give me eternal life forever. A life of joy a life of peace, a life where I sense I am being loved on and I am cared for all the time, okay? For those of us who have been here, I, I really want to ask the question one more time, how important is Jesus to you? And that is you're holding the bread and cup today. The worship team is just going to sing this song over you. And as you even hear the words of the song, I want you to think about this question. Do you believe, do you really believe Jesus can make you full?